Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1651-1651. Today we have a returning guest, Dr. David Collum, with the Betsy R. Miller uh, Chemistry and Chemical Biology Department at Cornell University. Now, you're thinking, what does that have to do with income property, Jason? It has a lot to do with it, because every year this professor does this whopper of a detailed year in review report and it gives a lot of insight into what's coming next so uh, it's all about the economy it's all about everything and I believe he said although don't quote me on this that this year's report was 197 pages long it's basically a book he writes every year on a year in review. So it's one of the most detailed year in review pieces you'll you'll find anywhere. He offers a way for you to get it for free. I believe it's uh, he gives that out at the end. So stay tuned for that. But before we get to it, we got to talk about housing prices. Folks, this is important news. Yes, it is. Okay, so I am... I am annoyed. <laughs> yes, and here's what you're you're thinking, Jason, you're always annoyed at something. Well, okay, you got me there. I do get annoyed at stuff, but hey, constructive discontent is what creates progress. It it's what moves the world forward. Yes, so I've got constructive discontent. <laughs> Here's my constructive discontent today. You know, sometimes does it ever feel like you yeah, just can't win? One particular person is annoying me. So uh, he goes around, I got my YouTube videos out there and such, and he makes these comments like, you know, you're a permabull. You're always promoting housing. You're talking your book, all this crapola. This guy is clueless. Here is the reality of the situation that I tried to explain to this, this gentleman. The reality of the situation is that as much as we love all of you investors, all of you buyers, and we love you, believe me, we love you, but we have two types of clients. We have buyer clients and we have seller clients, right? And guess what? Do you know which one we need more of right now? You guessed it. We need more seller clients. So if I were talking my book, here's what I would say. I would say, now is the time to sell because the housing market is going to crash. Things are in decline. It's all messed up. You better sell properties today or else. Yeah, that would be talk in my book. Because then, guess what we would have? We would have more inventory for all of the investor buyers who want to scoop up these properties. But the shortage we have is the inventory shortage. So I'm just telling you like it is, folks. Pretty much everything right now is looking like prices are going to continue to increase, like the housing market is going to continue booming, which, by the way, I don't even care. Remember, 
we invest in a multi-dimensional asset class. This is why we love income properties. We're not in it for the appreciation. The appreciation, yeah, it's the frosting on the cake. If it comes, I can spend it as well as the next guy. But who cares? We invest for yield. We invest for cash flow. That is the sign of an investor. Guess what the appreciation person is? They are a gambler. They are a speculator. They are not an investor. Remember the Jason Hartman definition of an investment. If it doesn't produce income, it is not an investment. It is only a mere speculation. Because that's what speculating is. It's looking for capital appreciation, and investing is looking for cash flow. That's what we like, cash flow. That good old-fashioned yield, we just love it, love it, love it. Yield outdoes risky speculative appreciation any day of the week. Now, if that appreciation comes, hey, wonderful. But we, we just like the yield because that's very reliable. Appreciation is not very reliable. But that said, I'm predicting that we're going to have more appreciation. I am bullish, you know, for the next year or so. All right? It's looking pretty good. Now, granted, something weird could happen. There could be some major event. Of course, that's always possible. But housing is actually quite affordable because we look at the mortgage payment to measure affordability, not the price of the property. And guess what? We adjust for inflation. So we're talking real dollar prices adjusted for inflation, not nominal dollar prices, where all of the morons that you listen to on TV are saying, well, uh, housing prices are so high now, and they're higher than they were in 2006, and guess what happened right after that? We had the Great Recession. Yeah, I know. I was there. I've been doing this for decades, longer than pretty much any podcaster out there that you're listening to. Maybe not. I haven't checked that. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Because all the ones I know of, you know, they started in 2012. Maybe they started in like 2005. Maybe they lie about when they started. <laughs> I know one of those, and I will not mention his name because, well, he's a weasel. What can I tell you? Weasel, weasel, weasel. <laughs> the guy lies. He lies as like a business plan. <laughs> it's funny. Ay, ay, ay. What are we going to do? Well, look, don't take it from me. Take it from, well, I don't necessarily want to say this is a credible source. Yeah, I do, actually. This is from Reuters. And CNBC. Now, the the CNBC distinction here I want to make is this. When you're looking at a report like the one I'm about to share with you before we get to our guest, this is reliable, okay? What's not as reliable is those talking heads on CNBC. You know, the guests that come on and they're always talking their book? Well, Bill Ackman would be a great example, you know, or whomever. I'm just picking on him because he got like a, what, a two or three billion dollar bet on his doom and gloomy CNBC visit that was like a half hour long, you know, during the sort of darkest days of the COVID crisis. And he was talking his book and he made a fortune doing that, let me tell you. It really worked. Okay. But this report says U.S. housing starts fell. They fell. More than expected in January amid soaring lumber prices. Am I overdoing it on the sound effects yet? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know, toward the end of the day here, I, I get a little punchy and I just got to amuse myself. So thank you for letting me amuse myself. All right. So soaring lumber prices causing a decline in housing starts. Remember, I taught you 
17, 18 years ago about packaged commodities investing. And these ingredients of the house, lumber and all the other ingredients, have been really in short supply, rising prices, and it is causing additional shortages in the overall packaged commodities final product or assembled commodities final product. The house that people want to buy or invest in or live in, right? Okay. The report says U.S. home building fell more than expected in January amid soaring lumber prices. Though a surge in permits for future construction suggested the housing market remains supported by lean inventories, lean inventories, and historically low mortgage rates. Housing starts decreased by 6% to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 1.5%. 580 million units last month, the Commerce Department said on Thursday. Economists polled by Reuters, is that Reuters or Reuters? I think it's Reuters. That's what I say. Had forecast would drop uh, to a rate of 1.658 million units in January. Home building fell 2.3% on a year over year basis. Folks, this is the worst time for home building to decline because there is a massive structural shortage, okay? So, uh, yeah, this is what we're dealing with here, folks. So if you don't think there is going to be additional upward pressure on price as well, then uh, maybe, may, and you know what? It's not you. It's not you, because you get it. You're listening to the show. You know what's going on. You are the well-informed investor. But you have those family members and those friends, like our friend George says, your friend and family member Fred, right? That, that dumb guy, right, in your family? <laughs> that guy is clueless. And you need to tell him to stop smoking that funny stuff because uh, he just, he's missing out. He's missing out. He's always got a reason everything's going to fall apart. You know, Peter Schiff is the same way. Okay. Softwood lumber prices jumped a record. You ready for this? <laughs> oh my God. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? I just want you to make sure you're ready for this. Just think about this for a moment. Softwood lumber prices jumped a record. Yes. Dun dun. They jumped a record 73% on a year-over-year -year basis in January. Now look, folks, we reported on this. Our client who is in the lumber business, who's investing with us, he came on the show and reported to you directly. We appreciated that. And guess what? There was an initial huge spike in these lumber prices because the mills were shut down due to the over the overreaction to COVID-1984, right? But then they came back online and that dissipated and the prices dropped a little bit and they normalized. But now we're way past that. We're talking January. These are the January statistics. So we're a year into this COVID-1984 thing now, okay? And we have a 73% increase in lumber prices. Tell me how housing prices are gonna decline when there is a shortage, there are record low interest rates, when the mortgage payment adjusted for inflation prices and interest rates is cheaper than it was 15 years ago, give or take, it's not exact, don't quote me on it, approximately 15 years ago, okay? And the ingredients, the packaged commodities that are the ingredients of the house are soaring in price and there are shortages and builders can't build as much as they want to meet demand because of these shortages of the ingredients. Look, if you want to bake a cake, you got to have the ingredients first. If you're missing ingredients, 
you ain't gonna bake the cake. And guess what? If you got a bunch of people lining up out the door that want to buy cakes, you can't meet the demand for the cake if you don't have the ingredients to make the cake. Home builders have the same exact problem. So tell me how prices are going to decline. I'm listening. Yeah, here we go. I'm listening. Come on. Someone tell me. Go to jasonhartman.com slash ask and tell me how the market is going to crash. jasonhartman.com slash ask. I want to hear. Tell me. Do I have a blind spot here? Everything is indicating that there is a good reason to be bullish on this market for quite a while. Yeah, I heard all the forbearance and the mortgage delinquencies. Well, guess what? I just read a report this morning. Mortgage delinquencies are down. The forbearance, big deal. That's like the deal of a century, the forbearance thing. But don't do it if you want to be buying properties because they're not going to make you a new loan. But the forbearance thing is a rockin' good deal. Okay, for someone who doesn't want to invest or buy, you know, getting into a forbearance program, they're just going to tack those payments onto the end of the loan. <laughs> I'll take that deal all day long. It sounds good to me. So, you know, th this, folks, anyway, enough said, enough said. Let's get to our guest. Let's hear what David has to say, because um, he is not so optimistic. I'm just going to warn you. Get ready. Get ready. He's not so optimistic. And I agree with him on a lot of this cultural stuff. It's a fiasco. It's a mess. But as far as how housing looks for, you know, probably a good year, it's super califragilistic expialidocious. And I can't remember what that actually means, but I think it's good. <laughs> okay, without further ado, here's our guest. Let's look at a year in review. It's my pleasure to welcome David Collum back to the show. He's been on a few times, and every year he does this amazing amount of research for his year in review. This year, it's about 190 pages long. He is a Betty R. Miller professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Cornell University. He's an intellectual. He researches stuff deeply. And one of the things I said to him before we started today is uh, this year or last year, I guess. <laughs> there is no shortage of content. David, welcome back. How are you? Yeah, I'm glad to be back. Looking forward to it. No no shortage of content, right? No shortage of content. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it's appalling, but it, it is appalling. It really is. So just give us your big take, Dave, and, and tell us what you really spent maybe the most time on or or, or wrote the most about. Well, the two things I labored the most over and had the most difficulty with turned out to be the um, COVID and the election because um, because everyone was sequestered. And I try to write about things people are not thinking about, maybe missing the plot line on. And, and you know, every basement, every every house in the country had a an epidemiologist, virologist, combo expert who were convinced they understood what they were seeing. And so how do you write about that? I... Uh, I found 2020 to be a particularly bleak year, not from the perspective of uh, of the COVID per se, but just social trends and and of course financial trends because I think the Fed's sending us towards the precipice. Okay, so let's talk about the financial stuff first. Uh, we've never seen more more currency creation ever than we did last year, and we're about to see a lot more. And, you know, Jerome Powell just doesn't seem concerned. You know, it's like that it's sort of before they wanted to come at the, the, the money creation sort of from an angle, right? But now it's it's like the gloves are off. It's just, you know, we're, we're going to just stimulate as much as we need to. We don't care. We're in this environment of these insanely low negative interest rates. I, I mean, in real terms, they're negative interest rates. This is a, a, a dysfunctional mess, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. I think it was Kevin Warsh who said that it would, would have been nice if we had entered this COVID crisis without having treated every day in the last 10 years as an emergency. So we basically entered this crisis already in a world of trouble. We had a massive corporate debt bubble. And in theory, 
people always talk about a correction, like the March correction. To technically call it a correction, you have to correct something. And they corrected absolutely nothing. And so we have more debt. We have people are in more trouble. The economy is weaker. The word stimulus is a euphemism for, for sort of a hyper monetary policy. It, it doesn't stimulate anything. This year was tricky because it's not like you could tell people they're not allowed to work and then say, and we're not going to compensate you for sitting at home. So, so it, it was just a humanitarian effort to, to print money this year. But, um, but I don't see a way out of this one. We've created massive amounts of additional debt. We've got markets that are, I think it was Drucky Miller the other day said they're crazier than he's ever seen in his life. And this guy's been around for a half a century. And, and you got uh, Jeremy Grantham saying for three years, he said we're in a bubble, but it's not over. Now he's saying it's over. So he doesn't mean this like today, but but he sees it, he sees all the symptoms of the very very end of a bubble phase. And this bubble is based on a pathetically bad story. This is not a euphoric technological revolution. It's not like Japan um, uh, pretending to uh, uh, to change the world or take over the world. This is the story is the Fed won't let the markets drop. That's that's a really stupid bubble. So the question is. What do you mean when you say bubble? That word is used a lot. Like, what does that mean to people watching and listening to us when you say bubble? Okay, well, there's degrees of bubble. Um, using in 18, I, I rounded up 20 metrics of valuation relative to historical norms. And in 2018, uh, all 20 showed us within an error bar of being a factor of two overvalued. So a 50% correction. And one which stayed down would have corrected the excess. And, and of course, it didn't stay down and it didn't happen. And, and so I'd call that a bubble because I, I, I showed a plot this year that was a column original. And I showed four paths that corrected 2x overvaluation. One is an immediate drop, and that's a 50% correction. The other is a horizontal horizontal water trend. So you say you're not going to make any money, any real inflation just return for until you sort of return to fair value. And that turns out to be 35 years at the rate of GDP growth that we experienced in the 20th century. And then there were variations, like you could take 25 years with a, a 20% drop or take 50 years with a, a 15 or 16% nominal real gain over 50 years. There is no path to go from 2x overvalued to historical fair value that doesn't involve excruciating amounts of, of either price correction or turn. And so now, that's when, when you say this, are you talking like broadly just all assets or are you talking about the stock market, the S&P? What do you mean? Well, you know, the stock market in general, but the bond markets the most overvalued bond market in history where, where, where it's something like 5,000 year lows, whatever that means, right? Heaven only knows what the Sumerians were charging, but, um, but, but bonds are so profoundly overpriced that you essentially can't make money. Now, if you're a bond trader, you can, because you can make money, you know, go and play in blackjack in Vegas too. But, uh, but if you buy standard issue treasuries or standard issue safe assets, uh, inflation adjusted, you're guaranteed to lose. You're, what the, I think the 30 years at 1.9%. I guarantee you inflation is not at 1.9%. And so the only question you face when you're buying bonds is for how long do I want to lose money? Not how much you can make. There's no revenue stream left in the bond market. That's amazing. It, 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 it really is totally dysfunctional. But, you know, you, you got to wonder, of course, inflation is massively underreported, especially when you put into that equation asset inflation, which, of course, is not really part of the CPI, but it's still there nonetheless. Right. But, but even then, inflation isn't as high as one might expect, given all the creation of, of new currency and new credit and, and all these all these instruments, really. How have they been able to dodge, you know, hyperinflation, which is probably what we should have? And can they just keep doing it forever or, well, or for so a long, long time? I, I, I don't know your listeners well. But if they've been paying close attention to the world, they'll be familiar with the Chapwood Index or they'll be familiar with shadowstats.com. I love the Chapwood Index. I've had John Williams on the phone. Uh, not yeah, not so, so much the other index. Towski or something with Chapwood. Uh, 
securities, and he produced an index that shows the inflation in 50 of the largest cities, which means most of the population. And he looks at 500 items, and he uses a very sort of meat and potato scale to measure price. So there's no yeah. adjustments, no substitution, no nothing. He just looks at price. And over the last five to six years, in the 50 largest cities, inflation, according to the Chapman Index, is running at, at 10%. Yeah. yeah. So so I, I just uh, grabbed it really quick so we could talk about it specifically. New York City, he's saying last year or, or sorry, first half of 2019, 12.1% inflation, Los Angeles, 12.6%, Chicago, 10.7%, Houston, 9.7%, Philadelphia, 11.2%, Phoenix, 76 San Antonio, 9.8%, San Diego, 11.2%, San Jose, 126 There are other but and in even places like you know Jacksonville, Florida, one of our markets where we recommend rental properties, eight point seven percent. Another one where we we recommend Indianapolis, nine point three percent. So you know those aren't all like high flying cities. Now, granted, a lot of this has changed with geography changing and what I call the twenty twenty grapes of wrath. <laughs> you know this this mass migration out of these expensive cities, which I think is actually a good thing, and you know should have happened a long time ago. You know. It, it was just massively accelerated. But these are significant inflation numbers. And, you know, people kind of one of the things I say, Dave, is that I, I'm constantly telling my listeners they've got to watch old movies, old TV shows, read old books, listen to old music. And when I say old, I, I only mean 30 years old, you know, 40 years old, not that long ago. OK, you know, watch, watch stuff from the 70s. Life in many ways, even when you compare it to the terrible 70s, has really gotten much more meager. You know, you look at housing prices and so inaccurate how it's measured because that the house inside got bigger. It got nicer, certainly. But there's no yard anymore. There's, you know, everybody's on top of each other in this high density environments that they didn't used to have. You know, the typical baby boomer home in, say, Lakewood, California, coming back from World War Two was on a quarter acre lot. OK, maybe even a half acre. Right. It's just a totally different thing nowadays. Well, I, I actually wrote a blog. I wrote an email that was turned into a blog years ago by Elizabeth Warren. And I relayed to her a story that happened. That, and she said, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for. So she put it in her, on her website back before she was famous. We used to swap emails late at night. And um, I happened to remember that when I was maybe 14, buying an extra large pizza at a pizzeria, you know, with the Italian guys, whatever, not, you know, not a, a Domino's but also not some New York City pizzeria, just some guys who was an extra large plate pizza I bought for two bucks. I also happen to know rather explicitly that at that same age, around 14, I could carry a couple of golf bags for four hours and get paid 10 bucks. So I was paying, uh, I was being paid one and a quarter extra large pizzas per hour as a 14 year old. Nowadays, you, you don't get that today. You don't get that. You'd have to be doing you'd have to be doing tricks on the street to get that kind of thing mm -hmm. as a 14 year old. And so yeah. um, so that shows you it's it, it's a it's a combination of sort of an inflation, but it shows you what kind of spending power you had and how when, when I was a kid, you'd watch TV shows and the father would be you know, a bus driver or, or, or own a shoe store or something. And he'd own a house. And they still had a family and things like that. And that's just not even theoretically possible. Yeah. And mom, mom didn't work. And right. the kids went to like good quality public schools and they had a home in a nice neighborhood with low crime. And, you know, what, what a lot of people don't notice too, Dave, is all of these things that were just being charged for that used to be free, like, you know, parking everywhere and, and just all of this stuff that you're, you're just, and you're doing all this stuff yourself nowadays where where you, you just have no like breathing room or margin. I used to have a travel agent. You used to go into restaurants and get waited on. Now, you know, and I'm not talking COVID. I'm just talking life and right. before right. that. You know, now, you know, you, you go up and wait at the counter. You, you may, They might bring you your food, but it's like minimal service. Last week, I stayed at the beautiful, iconic Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. I spoke at a conference down there in Miami Beach. And, you know, this is like this iconic hotel. 
no service. There's like no staff around. You can't get help with anything. These places, there used to be just, there's just no people around anymore. And this is not given the, the pandemic. Okay. This is before that you've got these, these buildings, these hotels, and, and they're like run by just a few skeleton crew people because it's so expensive to employ people and the people are being tracked and monitored and they have no leisure in their jobs anymore. I mean, God forbid they work for Amazon slave driver company. You know, they, they can't even rest or talk or have a conversation with their coworkers without being, you know, sanctioned by their boss. Well, the other un, unseen inflation, which, which I, again, several times I've written about it, it is the, the depreciation rate. And so, uh, so I do a big segment this year about wealth creation, and I, I talk about what the GDP does not show you. You know, if, if you go to the movies with your family, it costs you about a hundred bucks, and the experience that goes into GDP, but but it's it also it has a, a a life expectancy of two and a half hours. And whereas if you bought, say, a Black & Decker drill or something, but but I, we put a, a refrigerator to, to pasture this year out of a cabin and it was 70 years old. When they created that refrigerator, it, it was huge wealth creation because, first of all, it's operation, not that different. Doesn't have an ice maker. OK, big deal. Um, but it lasted 70 years. And so I introduced, reintroduced the idea of using what's called NDP or net domestic product. And that's that's the cost of something. Uh, minus the depreciation, and so we've got huge depreciation rates. And to me, those are a. Um, those what, are what, what do you, What do you, you mean? Are you just saying that products are built to have obsolescence sooner? They're not built to last like they used to be. Is that right? What They're absolutely built not to last. So, so I have a dishwasher in my house, which is built in '89, and the woman who cleans the house says, "Yeah, that's probably the original." So that dishwasher has been banging around for 31 years. If I bought a replacement. It would still clean the dishes about the same, and it would last about seven years is the estimate. So one, to compare those two dishwashers, and the economists like to say, well, the new one has all these buttons and gadgets. Who cares? I just need something to squirt the dishes with a lot of water. But, but, but you have to account for the fact that I get, I get out of the first dishwasher four or five, maybe 10 times the amount of, of usage and that's inflationary. If you uh, if the uh, automatic window in your car breaks, it's a fifty cent piece of plastic, but you're going to end up spending five hundred to replace the unit required. So the, the the repairs, how many things do you break that you can repair? That's huge depreciation rates. So depreciation, accelerated depreciation, is a mass of in, hidden inflation, and in everything we buy. You know, and a great example, here's one for you, the, your cell phone. It's a miracle of modern technology, right? How can you possibly talk about the inflationary effects of the cell phone? Well, first and foremost, you have to buy one every couple of years. They go out of date. I couldn't use Audible on my old cell phone. I had to buy a new one to get it, to get Audible. The other thing is, is you say, but it's, it's miraculous. I go, yes, but it's required. And so you take a family of four and they're required. And so you got to buy the phones and you got to pay for the phone service. And pretty soon you're talking, I don't know what, 200 bucks a month at least. Well, and everybody's got to have a laptop and an iPad too. Well, you have to, or your kids, yeah, you and, can't, and you can't function. Yeah. You can't function. And so, yeah. so how do you account for the, the added cost of miraculous technology? This no longer option. How do you account yeah. for the fact that, you know, if you're earning $50,000, you might be dropping 4% of your income on tech that you didn't have to drop 4% of your income on. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, you, you're not going to be able to get an education, go to school or do anything if you don't have the technology. And of course, then there's all these subscriptions we all have too. You know, those aren't counted in the CPI. I used to have, you know, maybe a couple subscriptions. You know, when I signed up for AOL in the 90s, you know, that was like a big thing, whether I want to spend $10 a month or whatever it costs. Now you got a myriad array of subscriptions. I mean, I have hundreds of subscriptions to things and they all have to be managed. They suck up my time. The credit cards expire. They need to be, you know, it's just, it's just a whole different world. I mean, you know, look at, I'm not a total pessimist. I do think it's an amazing time to be alive because I keep getting amazed by this technology, but I think it's the concept of margin and the concept that we're doing this all ourselves nowadays. There's no service anymore. You know, uh, I, I, I don't know how Dave, what is it that tech companies 
are excused from answering the phone. Now, well, I, 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 I'm trying to get a third credit card because I want to have one card that I do just auto payments on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's I a good idea. See, so I can see what I'm being pinged on every month much more yeah. easily. Right. And I'm having so much trouble and I'm going to the same card company. So I've got yeah. two credit cards and they're making me jump through hoops. I'm going, dudes, you already gave me two cards. Give me a third card. It's just an, an every, everything. Everything's run by a stupid algorithm, you know? No, I don't know. I asked the question, what the tech company, I've got a big section on this wealth creation idea. And I, I asked the question, what do these silicon-based Goliaths do compared to their carbon-based Goliaths, Exxon Mobil, US Steel, things like that. The wealth creation of the early 20s was way, way, way higher than the wealth creation of the present. So you can say, ah, oh, what about Amazon? Well, the Sears Roebuck catalog was way more pioneering than Amazon, way more pioneering. You went from buying flour and nails and stuff out of a barrel in a country store to be able to order thousands, one of thousands of different things. This was 120 years ago. And so you could order it. It might take you two weeks instead of one day. Who cares? And so the Sears Robot Catalog was a massive increase in wealth creation, and Amazon is incremental. So then I look at Google or Facebook. Facebook could disappear today. No one would care. No one would care. Scraping as as data, long as it disappeared for everybody at the same time. But Facebook just, scraping data to, to sell the advertising. It's just advertising. Yeah. So if they want to try to sell me a certain kind of mattress or a certain kind of car, whatever, but it's not in any way wealth creation. You know, it's ever so slightly, for example, they target me better, sign up with a better, more appropriate car than I would have gotten, maybe. But but it's just, it's, it's they're gigantic advertising budgets. They're attacks on the system. I don't need them scraping data to try to tell me what to buy because I, I know what to buy. I know what I need. Okay, so lest we complain too much, <laughs> and I know we got off on this track, but you know what? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, what are your thoughts about inflation? Uh, you know, first of all, I, I we both agree it's already here, but how much worse is it going to be? Well, so if you read some of the ancient archives, it talks about the idea of inflating away debt which appears to be the subplot that, that they're doing. This will be continued on the next episode. Thank you for listening and happy investing. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.